Welcome to McCormick Theological Seminary, where we invite you to trust the journey. A vibrant community located in Chicago, McCormick is where God calls you to grow and lead beyond traditional limits through academic rigor, theological reflection, and liberating experiences. At McCormick, we offer the following master's and doctoral programs. Our master's level programs offer students opportunities to be transformed as leaders in the church and society through academic pursuits, critical reflection, and faithful witness. The master's programs that we offer include the Master of Divinity, the Master of Arts and Ministry for both English and Spanish speakers, and the Master of Theological Studies. The D-Men program in McCormick is culturally attentive, context-based, and values group learning. Students matriculate through the program in specialized cohorts, including pastoral care, prophetic leadership, the Korean American cohort, and the Apostolic Assembly cohort. We also offer collaborative D-Men cohorts that include the Ecumenical D-Men and the Acts D-Men in Preaching. McCormick is also home to world-class faculty. Take a moment, listen to Professor and Dean of Faculty Dr. Steve Davidson. I'm Steve Davidson. I'm professor of Hebrew Bible Old Testament and I'm also the Dean of the faculty. I came to McCormick at a critical time in my own life and professional development, but it was also an important time in the development of the institution. And I came and I saw an institution that was flexible, adaptable, always asking the question, what does it mean to be around at this time? What does it mean to be involved in theological education at this time? And I, I fit into an academic program that was asking that question and moving us in those directions. This school has continued to equip people to be the best that they can be wherever it is they feel challenged to work. And so we give students the kind of insights, skills, capacities, and the wherewithal so that they can serve the best way they know. This challenges me as a teacher because it means that I have to craft classes and class sessions to help students answer the strong questions, how to take theological traditions and theological resources that are as old as our thinking and make them adaptable and useful in a contemporary world. That's an exciting task for me as a teacher and I try to make it an exciting task in the classroom. Not only does our faculty pour into our student body, they also lead and support various initiatives at McCormick, including the Solidarity Building Initiative that provides liberative carceral education at Cook County Jail, the Trauma Healing Initiative that equips clergy and faculty with the capacity to respond to the communal and systematic nature of trauma, the Center for Reparatory Justice, Transformation, and Remediation that works to promote and advance consciousness of repertory justice and engendered communities of practice for people of African descent within local, national, and global communities. Learn more about these initiatives and other faculty-driven initiatives by visiting mccormick.edu or scanning the QR code in the corner. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about our beloved, vibrant community. Wondering if this is the right time for you? Listen to students who believe now is their time. My time here has been an incredible gift professionally and vocationally. My McCormick journey has moved me from being a person who was locked into one way of understanding scripture into being a person with a more expansive view. We could tell the passion and the excitement that the students and the faculty and professors felt about seminary. And it was igniting and engaging.
Good evening, dear friends. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us for this very special Seven Last Words from the Cross service. Please join me in offering our heartfelt thanks to McCormick Center for African American Ministries and Black Church Studies, its director, the amazing Reverend Dr. Stacy Edwards Dunn, Reverend Priscilla Rodriguez, and our communications and IT teams who make all of this possible. Of all the wonderful programs and events at McCormick each year, this service has always been one of my favorites. Pre-pandemic, for more years than I can remember, this service was held at Pullman Presbyterian Church, where for 32 years, our alum, our mentor, our dear, sweet friend, Reverend Dr. Eddie L. Knox Jr. served as pastor. It is hard for many of us to imagine this event even in this virtual space without Eddie's warm welcome and embrace. Pastor Knox transitioned in the early hours of Monday morning. In this holy week, as we anticipate the joy of the resurrection to come, we send our love and prayers to First Lady Linda Knox, Eddie's daughter, our friend and McCormick student Janine, the entire Knox family and the congregation at Pullman Presbyterian Church, Eddie, your presence and love surround us. May we continue to share the love you shared with all of us. Again, on behalf of everyone at McCormick, thank you for joining us this evening. Greetings to you in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. My name is the Reverend Dr. Sharon Ellis Davis. I'm an affiliate professor at McCormick Theological Seminary and former director for the Center for African American Ministries and Black Church Studies. I'm here today just to say thank you, God. Thank you for the life and the love and the legacy of the Reverend Eddie K. Knox Jr., who is the pastor emeritus of Pullman Presbyterian Church in the great city of Chicago. I just want all of you to know how much we loved him at McCormick how he served with a smile on his face, never wavering from what his commitment was to his institution and to the people that were to come. And so we thank you, God, for him. And we want you to know how much we loved him and how much we definitely will miss him. The Center for African American Ministries especially thanks him for the way that he has supported us down through the years. I left there in 2010 and he was still, still supporting the center and he still was supporting it now. And so we thank God for him. We offer blessings and love and power. And we know that all things will be well because God's got him. Raise my hand and say, thank you, Lord. God bless you all. Before we meditate the word of God, let's pray. And God, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for this privilege. Just we are going to meditate your word, what you've spoken on the cross, that truly, I tell you, before you'll be with me in the paradise. We believe you, my God, you have died for us. You are ready to forgive our sins. We surrender to you, my God. Bless those who listen to the word and speak to the word. Be with us and guide us. I pray in the name of our Christ. Amen. Amen. Look, at, let's read the chapter. Luke, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hanged the herald insult at him, Are not you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But another criminal rebuked him, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what your deeds deserve. But this man had nothing wrong. 
Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Then Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The God speaks, he is giving the authentic answer to the criminal who is beside him and the place where he can be occupied the paradise. In Greek words, he is translated to a paradise source. Even the Old Testament translated the word paradise means the Garden of Eden. And even the Judaism at the time of Jesus, they assumed the word of paradise is heaven. So paradise is a wonderful place where the righteous people can take rest after the death. And the thing that even being a thief and hanging on the cross, the criminal thought that the Jesus can forgive my sin and give me a place in the paradise. You and me realize that where we are standing, are we ready to ask forgiveness from Jesus? Do you have the faith in God? Even though we have gone through so much that we traveled as our way can be a thorn or sin or terrifying, whatever the situation we came through, we come across. But do you have the heart to ask forgiveness to Jesus? Remember the edge of the time when Jesus is going to die before hanging on the cross, as he is a fully man and fully God, he too has the pain and the thirst and the shameless, shameless, everything he has, I mean, he has gone through in the cross because of you and me. But even though he has the capacity to do as a God what he has to done in the world. And he has fulfilled the word of God. I mean, his father's commitment, what has to be done as it is in the heaven, I mean, through Jesus Christ in the earth. He's obey his father's word and he loved the human as well as even he has pain and the thirsty as being a human. Yeah. And the thing that when who won, the thief who is hanging near the Jesus is watching everything that is going around him, people mocking Jesus, beating him, and crowning him in thorn, and so on. But the thief has and no idea who Jesus is, but he does know that the sentences of crime is in the day was to be crucified. He could have assumed that Jesus has committed to crime as well, but that is why he has crucified. But when he heard Jesus say, Lord, forgive them, the first word, the first statement, what Jesus has spoken in the cross. So according to that, what seeing all those things, the thief thought that the man of God can forgive me and give me the place in the paradise. So think of the today's life, friends. Are we ready to ask forgiveness? God is ready to forgive us. He has taken all our sin upon him and died on the cross in our places. So no matter what our sins are, who are we, God willing to forgive our sin and give us an eternal life. 
after death. According to Luke 6, chapter 16 and verses 19 to 31, after the death, we can go heaven or hell. If we're ready to confess our sin, truly God is there to forgive our sin. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the God's paradise. Says Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, who is in the victorious person? Anyone who is washed in Jesus' blood is called victorious. Therefore, let us confess our sin. Amen. Be washed in the blood and receive the right to eat from the tree of life. How the criminal has used the opportunity to get forgiveness from Jesus. Use the opportunity as we are being in the world. And we have enough time to ask God forgiveness. This is not the late a delay what we think, but still God is available to forgive our sin, you and me. So dear friends, let's realize and take the opportunity to ask forgiveness from the God and be in the paradise. Let's pray. God, thank you, God, this wonderful time. What we meditate, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in the paradise. You are ready to give the Garden of Eden and the place in heaven if you are ready to ask forgiveness to you, my God. We believe you. We love you, my God that you are loving us till today you are ready to be with us and forgive our sin as a father thank you god for your love on the cross we pray in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen Muy buenas tardes a todos, muchas gracias por esta preciosa oportunidad que usted me brinda de poder traer hasta ustedes la palabra del Señor um, hablando de la tercera palabra que Jesús dijo en la Cruz del Calvario. He titulado este pequeño mensaje, desde entonces este discípulo la recibió en su casa. No puedo pensar realmente en otra escena en las escrituras que hable con más afecto al corazón de una madre que cuando Jesús pronunció estas pocas palabras en sus labios secos. Mujer, aquí tienes a tu hijo. Juan 19, 26. Seas madre o no, este texto nos revela el clamor, las lecciones y el legado de la última intercesión que tuvo Jesús con su madre antes de su muerte. Esta es la tercera palabra de Jesús, pronunciada desde la cruz, el día que fue crucificado a causa de tus pecados y los míos. Jesús no se dirige a su madre como madre, sino como mujer, traducida apropiadamente como querida mujer por la nueva versión internacional. Podríamos sentir un poquito de frialdad en el término tal como se usa en nuestras culturas. Pero en la cultura de Jesús era perfectamente apropiada que un hombre se dirigiera a una mujer de esa manera. Pero aún así era extraño que un hijo se dirigiera de esa manera hacia su madre. Yo creo que la razón de este discurso, hablando un poquito más formal, Creo que Jesús tuvo la disposición de hablar de esto para pretender que sus palabras se entiendan como una disposición testamentaria formal bajo las familias 
judías. Jesús una vez más nos demuestra el amor y la responsabilidad por su prójimo. Aunque su prójimo en este momento no era su vecino o la vecina de al lado, sino la mujer que fue usada como instrumento para ser engendrado y nacido para su propio uh, propósito redentor. Vemos entonces cómo el amor que hay en las palabras que se expresan, tal vez no con mucha emoción por el momento en que el Hijo del Hombre estaba pasando pero palabras que han marcado a la humanidad a través del cuido de Jesús y ese cuido que Jesús mostró a su querida madre, dejándole al cuido de su discípulo amado, un compañero que él conocía, no se lo dejó a cualquiera, se lo dejó a aquel que se recostaba sobre su pecho, aquel que conocía de verdad que había cambiado su amistad con Jesús para estar a su lado. A ese Jesús confía a su madre, al cuido de Juan. Y Juan se toma tan en serio este papel de cuidar a esta mujer que definitivamente la entra a su casa. Se habrá tal vez alguna vez preguntado uh, si Jesús estaba interesado en el cuido de aquellas todas mujeres que de una u otra manera estaban, están, o posiblemente pasarían por causa del mismo sufrimiento que su amada madre en ese momento estaba pasando. Yo creo que sí. Yo creo que, que Jesús estaba, yo creo que sí. Jesús estaba en el huerto del Edén cuando la mujer fue criada por el Creador del Universo. Y una vez más Jesús se encuentra en el destino de la mujer aunque esta vez muy diferente porque se trataba de la progenitora terrenal y él lo sabía muy bien. Había convivido con ella por 33 años y esta vez como hijo se ve envuelto y en la obligación como primogénito de María de velar por su bienestar y asegurarse de que tenga un lugar donde vivir y comida para comer durante toda su viudez. Yo me pregunto que si esto Jesús hizo poniéndose una vez más como un ejemplo vivo para nosotros, como iglesia, como grupo eh, amante de Dios. Creo que si nosotros, como la comunidad de fe, queremos ser cada día más semejantes a Jesús, entonces debemos de obedecer el mandato que Jesús dio a Juan mientras se aglomeraba al pie de la cruz, de cuidar por la mujer que lo, amam que lo amamantó en su seno maternal. Si nosotros, como comunidad de fe, no hemos entendido que Jesús nos ha dado ese mismo mandato de hacer lo mismo por la mujer caída en el campo de la batalla de la sobrevivencia, o por la mujer viuda que se ha quedado en el quebrantamiento de su pérdida, o a la mujer indocumentada y extranjera que se vetupera sus derechos de ser libre en una sociedad imperialista, que la margina por su estatus migratorios, o aquella mujer que su color dicta su posición socioeconómica. Como comunidad de fe estamos soltando la responsabilidad de atender la necesidad del tráfico infantil, sobre todo de niñas que crecerán en la esclavitud del sexo, perdiendo uh, su inocencia y el derecho de ser niñas a una edad temprana. O en esos lugares como Afganistán, por ejemplo, por la inaniación y la pobreza que se vive en ese lugar, se ven obligados como madre y padre a vender a sus niños, a sus bebés, especialmente a las jovencitas, para que tengan más posibilidad de vivir. Jesús nos dice hoy como comunidad de fe, comunidad, he aquí tu madre, recibámoslas en nuestra casa. Porque si callamos como comunidad de fe, entonces estamos a favor de la injusticia que se vive en el mundo entero. 
Seamos más atentos a la necesidad de una comunidad que clama a través del sufrimiento que le llevas a la casa de la injusticia y no a la casa del amor que Dios nos dijo que teníamos que tener hacia nuestros semejantes. Necesitamos amar a nuestros semejantes como a nosotros mismos y así ayudarles a a la comprensión del porqué de las cosas. Nuevamente pronuncio el día de hoy las palabras que Jesús dijo cuando estaba a punto de morir crucificado en esa cruz por mis pecados y por tus pecados. Comunidad de fe, he aquí tu madre, cuídala. Seven last words, word number four. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Our text is in Matthew 27, verse 46. The New Revised Standard Version. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of the word. The title for today is Jesus' Purpose Greater Than His Pain. There are times in our life that we will face unbearable pain. When such occurs, you are challenged to ask yourself, is my purpose greater than my pain? Hmm. The scripture provides us a mental visual within our heads of the suffering and agony Jesus was experiencing on the cross. Jesus was in humanity, but never ceased from being divine. In his humanity, he was subject to the pain and suffering that we are and our sinful bodies go through. All this was in the cup, the cup that Jesus noted during the Last Supper. We would call Jesus' prayer, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. That was Matthew 26, chapter verse 39. Jesus was clear and concise as to what was needed to be done and remain faithful to God even through his painful death. Eli, Eli, Lama, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, which is a pronominal suffix, a short suffix, meaning thou hast left me, abandoned me, a cry of distress. The cry is recorded in St. Matthew's and St. Mark. Its absence in St. John's narrative was probably since John had taken the Virgin Mother from the scene of the crucifixion, as that was too much for her to bear. So follow me as we explore Jesus' purpose greater than his pain. This is demonstrated in two points, knowing your purpose enduring the pain. And knowing your purpose, let us first establish that our purpose is not given by humanity. It is given by God. When your back is against the wall, it is your purpose that helps you persevere. If your purpose is given by humanity, it is temporal. But when, you're, when our purpose is given by God, it is eternal. So I ask you, do you have a purpose? What's driving your purpose? Are you being led by God Almighty or some idol that is temporal? So when you know your purpose, you walk, your walk is different. Your talk is different. Your focus is different. When you know your purpose, your preparation is different. Much of the things you do and the things that you say are aimed at achieving 
your purpose in God. Enduring the pain is a byproduct of achieving your purpose. So your purpose must be greater than your pain for you to continue to proceed in your purpose in God. This is where you are stretched in accomplishing your purpose. Jesus is teaching us in the last hour, this last moment, that your purpose in God must be greater than your pain. God, I ask for your strength. I ask, as we did in the Apostle Paul states, God, give me the mind of Christ so that I too may have purpose beyond my pain. That what may come, that I will be able to handle so that I can achieve my purpose in you. Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was referring to Psalms 22, verse 1, where Jesus was repeating the Psalm of David. And Jesus is showing us that when we go through despair, when we go through hurt and pain and suffering, rely on the scripture, repeat the scripture, speak the scripture. David was, David was referencing why God was so far from helping him as he was groaning. This groaning is denoted as a deep and articulate sound conveying pain and despair. Jesus was exhibiting this pain, this same sense of pain and groaning, and maybe that is why Jesus referenced the Psalm of David. He was the sacrificial lamb. His life saved all of humanity. So I live today because Jesus died on the cross and because all the pain, the suffering, the agony, despair that Jesus experienced was all for the sins of you, 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 and me. It was for all of us. Now we don't have to wait until the battle is over. We can shout right now, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you, grace. Thank you, mercy. Thank you, Jesus. The text connection is to the death of Christ, transformed to eternal life for humanity. We know this because Jesus said in John 12, 24, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So in Jesus' death, we live. In Jesus' death, we are returned to our kinship, our friendship, and our fellowship with God. Because of Jesus' death, we can shout hallelujah. We can shout thank you, Jesus. We can shout glory to God and say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Jesus, your blood still works. Jesus, you are our redeemer. Jesus. You are our savior. Jesus, you are a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Jesus, you are the first and the last. Jesus, you are the alpha and the omega. So God, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And we will magnify you, glorify you, lift you up and give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. For now we see that our purpose in you is greater than our pain. My brothers and sisters, let us go in peace and continue in our purpose in God. For our purpose in God should always, should always be greater than our pain. Greetings, McCormick family and friends. And thank you to all of the preachers that have shared or will be sharing messages this Good Friday. It's a privilege and an honor to provide a word from McCormick's virtual pulpit today. Please join me in a moment of prayer. 
Dear Creator, thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our beloved Redeemer. As I venture into this word, please keep me out of the way so that the people will see only your light, comfort, grace, and mercy. Our world grows ever more dangerous and the solutions more challenging to come by. But we know with faith and works, nothing is impossible. God, we love you and we praise your holy name. Amen. Family, our scripture for this fifth word, I am thirsty, is from John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. I'll be reading from the message version. Jesus seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might also be complete, then said, I am thirsty. A jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone would have put a sponge soaked with the wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. The word of God for the people of God. In all of the Bible, Jesus makes this claim, I am thirsty just one time. This bit of humanness is never spoken by Jesus until his earthly work ends. Now, many of us are familiar with the earlier water story in chapter 4 in this same book of John, where Jesus asked the Sumerian woman to give me some water to drink. But that request for water was really the setup for the more important conversation that culminated in verse 13, as Jesus tells her, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. Jesus was giving the water of eternal life, not H2O. Jesus' expression of thirst in our scripture today was for real. We have all been thirsty before. The thirst we experience after a particularly challenging expenditure of energy perhaps on a basketball court, a run, jog, even a long walk, can be intense as our body demands a resolution to the loss of water. We can add to those examples of true exertion, carrying a cross to your execution. Physiologically, the process of becoming thirsty works like this. Within our brains is an area called the lamina terminalis, or LT for short. There is a blood-brain barrier that filters away harmful elements floating in our blood from our brains, dangerous things like bacteria, viruses, and other toxins. The LT has cells that are outside that blood-brain barrier, accessing the blood flow and able to evaluate the level of salt in our system to determine if we need water and thus send the brain signals that we are thirsty and that we should seek water. Jesus was dehydrated and his body was telling him he was thirsty. That Jesus declares, I am thirsty, should come as no surprise. After all, in addition to dragging that cross to Golgotha, where he was crucified, he was on the cross for as many as six hours, bleeding from significant wounds. Stakes through the hands and feet, we typically think of, but also bleeding from the head wounds, from the piercing of the crown of thorns, and even a wound to his side by a spear. The water was literally draining from Jesus' body. The soldier's response to Jesus' plea, I am thirsty, to offer a sponge soaked in sour wine or wine vinegar, seems like one more humiliation, one more show of disrespect, one more bit of torture. Calling to mind Psalm 69, 20 and 21, which reads, insults have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst gave me vinegar to drink. Have you ever called out for help, but the request fell on the ears of people that had no love for you, that ridiculed you, that even despised you? Maybe it was in school. Your request for help was met with disdain because the teacher had an implicit bias due to your color or your weight or your accent or your unwashed clothes. They had low expectations of you and thus were less willing to spend time helping you to keep up. Maybe it was at work. You had an issue with a coworker talking to you inappropriately and you raised a concern with your manager. 
even escalated it to your HR department. And the end result was you being moved and even being branded as a poor team player. Or maybe it was in a hospital. So often, marginalized women, men, and children are not provided the same level of care as that of the privileged. Less effective treatments being provided, older or cheaper treatments. Maybe you were sent home too early after surgery. Or you may have had a limb amputated when there were other options available. Research has found all of these circumstances to be real. When marginalized people call out for help, just like Jesus, instead of the water they need, they often get vinegar. Jesus on the cross, still aware but weakening, his humanity in evidence as his body is shutting down. Jesus calling softly to his torturers, I am thirsty. His declaration floating among people who despise him. Jesus provided with sour wine and vinegar. When we are thirsty, drinking fluids releases dopamine, a chemical that when released in our brains causes us to feel good. Any fluid can elicit this response, even those that are not particularly good at relieving thirst. And for Jesus, the vinegar, instead of causing additional distress, meets his need as acidic liquids still wet the mouth and give the body the impression of hydration, stimulating a strong saliva response. The wine vinegar provides him with the moisture needed to make his final proclamations allowing Jesus to fulfill his mission among us and fulfill the scripture. As Joseph said, you planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. Jesus in making his declaration, I am thirsty, among his enemies provides a lesson for us. Just because we are among people that may not like us, we must still speak up. We must make our needs known even in the midst of those that are apathetic or adversarial. We must speak up even in our pain, suffering, and sorrow. Silence is not an option. Our friends aren't the only sources of support and assistance, and we must avail ourselves of the resources needed to improve our situation and the circumstances of our loved ones and communities. Family, when Jesus was breathing his last breaths, when his work was almost done, he had a bit more to say, and he let the soldiers around the cross know, I am thirsty. And they responded with what they thought would further impair him, but it was what he needed. God turned evil to good, even at the cross, and God will do that for us. When your child isn't getting the attention they deserve in school, speak up. Tell the teacher, tell the principal, go to the school board if you must, but do not suffer in silence. Your voice may result in policy changes that affect many children for the better. As we receive medical attention for our ailments, speak up, ask questions of the physicians, take notes, research your options, get second opinions, share your outcomes with family and friends. There is wisdom in the room, but only if we share. Moving through the world, we witness so much of what's wrong with our world. A young woman being mistreated by a store clerk a village of the homeless on an expressway service drive or under a viaduct, a street of boarded up businesses, young men hanging out on street corners with no outlets for their imaginations to be exercised or their potential to be nurtured. Speak up. Alice Walker reminds us in her poem to change the world enough. Quote, we must walk together without fear. There is no path without us, unquote. Beloved, when we are thirsty, say it. Speak up. God bless you. It is finished. One of the very last words expressed by Jesus on the cross, it is finished, is found in John chapter 19, verse 30. It is one of the most important and emotional phrases. This is the sixth saint by Jesus on the cross. In Greek, it is finished is one word, tetelestai, means finished. The phrase, it is finished, refers to the completion of Jesus' pain for the sins of the world. He fulfilled his purpose, 
for coming to earth. This is a cry of triumph. Secondly, it is finished was not the gulps of, of a worn out life, but the deliberate utterance of a clear consciousness. That is, his work was finished. What is finished? That is an excellent question to ask. For example, think that you have asked a person to fix your heater. When he is doing the work, you can ask that person, is it finished? How long it will take? The, per the person might respond and say, it will take some time. But after a few minutes, he will come and tell you, my job has finished. It is finished. My dear people of God, did Jesus do the same? God had a purpose for Jesus. After Jesus accomplished that purpose or the work Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. We'll keep that question aside for a while. I have a question for all of you. Why did Jesus come to this world? I know we have many reasons, we have many answers. I have nine answers. Firstly, Jesus came to fulfill the law. St. Matthew chapter 5 verse 70. Jesus came to divide. St. Luke chapter 12 verse 51. Jesus came to call sinners. Mark 2 verse 17. Jesus came to serve and to give his life. Mark 10 chapter 45. Jesus came to proclaim the good news. Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19 verse 10. Jesus came to do his father's will. John 6 verse 38. This is very, very important. I will read that. I will read out that verse for you. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Eighthly, Jesus came to give abundant life. John 10 verse 10. Finally, the last thing for me, the ninth one, Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. John 18 verse 37. All these reasons are correct. Jesus came to fulfill the law, call sinners to serve, seek and serve the, and save the lost and give abundant life. Yes, yes, yes. All are true. But what is the main reason for Jesus to come to this world? In my point of view, to proclaim the kingdom of God. I believe that is the main reason for Jesus. I'm not saying others are incorrect. All are correct. But the main reason is to proclaim the kingdom of God. According to Luke chapter 4, verse 43, it says, But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also. Because that is why I was sent. Because that is why I was sent to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of the God. In this passage, Jesus proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus came to this world. My dear people of God, before the arrest of Jesus by the Romans, Jesus prayed his last public prayer where he asked the Father to glorify him, even as he had glorified the Father. He prayed to finish the work you have given me to do in John chapter 17 verse 4. It says, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. I believe that Jesus prayed to Abba Father before everything. Jesus prayed to Abba Father before everything. God gave his beloved son to this world that this world believes in him and may not perish but have eternal life. My dear friends, Jesus did his part in this world. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. He taught the values of the kingdom. kingdom. One more important thing, Jesus teaches his disciples for the future mission. Why am I saying it is important because 
they are the ones who started the mission after the resurrection of Jesus. My dear people of God, now on the cross, Jesus is saying, Father, you sent me into this world for a purpose. I did that according to your will, but the world did not understand it. It is finished. In the sermon preached on April 5th, 1998, Reverend B. Gritter says, It is finished is a shout of victory. He further says, So in his very last words, Jesus is in complete control. No one had more control over his death and dying than Christ did. Father, now it is finished. Now I commit my spirit unto thee. For Reverend Greater, it is a cry of victory. My dear friends, you may sit at peace today. You may be in absolute peace right now because the Lord said, it is finished for you. I've done it for you. It is a cry of victory. As thou, as thou now is going, goes to heaven and leaves the rest of salvation up to you based on your will and your works and your reaching out to him by your ability. In that what he means, Reverend Gritter clearly says, I've done my part and I go my way. Jesus saying, I've done my part and I go my way now you do your part now you do your part my dear people of god yes jesus has done his part now it is time to do our part jesus made a sacrifice for you and me that no one else would do that is the jesus's love and mercy upon us what are the things that we can do what are the things that we can start Think a little, my friend. The disciples began the mission from where Jesus had stopped. Then Paul has taken the mission into Gentiles. Day by day, Jesus called different people for that mission. If the mission is a relay, the baton was shifted to the, to, shifted to the hands of the people day by day. That is why today, you and I, you and me, glorify Jesus in our churches because of that mission. We sit comfort comfortably in churches because of that mission. The journey after Jesus, as we know, was not an easy one. We know that with the persecution in the early Christian church, Christian carried the name of Jesus. Many have sacrificed their lives for that mission of Jesus. My dear people of God, Jesus said, it is finished. Now start your part from today. Now start your part from today onwards. We may feel that it's too late to do this. No, 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 we are not too late. We are not late, my friends. We try to do a little thing for Jesus in our earthly, earthly pilgrimage. Once we do that, we can say, we can say to Almighty Jesus, we can praise and say, Lord Jesus, it is finished. So what are the things that we can start? I suggest you start from where you are. Look at your surroundings. Look at your neighborhood. Think about your workplace. If children are listening to this sermon, think about your school. Think about your friends. The Lord has put you in those plague places because we have a work, you have a mission to do, mission to accomplish from those places. That is what I believe. Start today. Think about the people who do not know about Jesus, Jesus' Jesus's love for them. Have you ever prayed for them? Jesus rejoiced in the kingdom of heaven over one who accepts himself. Have you, ever, have you ever been able to do that? According to Rick Warren, before you were born, Jesus had already planned your life, your country, 
your state, your city, your street, your address, your skin color have been planned by Jesus. Because Jesus wants you to do something from him, from that place, from where are you? My dear people of God, at least start, start one thing for God and tell one day, Jesus, it is finished. I will give you some examples. You can tell others what Jesus has done for you. Share God's words with others, other people. Tell them about God's love and Jesus' sacrifice. Send, spend time with other believers. Spend, spend time with them. Listen to their problems and be there when they need you. As they see Jesus working in your life. They may be more curious to learn more about Jesus. I'm not saying, I'm not saying to convert them, but challenge them through your life examples. Again, I'm saying, I'm not saying to convert them. I'm not saying that, but challenge you from through your life examples. Tell them that Jesus loves them too. Finally, what I said may be hard for you to do, but you can pray to Jesus and ask, Jesus, I know you died for me. Please show me one thing that I can do for you. I need to do one thing for you because before I die, I need to do one thing for you before I die. And I, and I, and I want to say it is finished. Amen. Grace and peace to you. I am Essie Hall, Master of Divinity student, and I shall present to you today the seventh word. Before I begin, I stand in solidarity with the McCormick Theological Seminary community in offering our sincerest condolences to the family of Reverend Dr. Eddie L. Knox Jr. and the Pullman Presbyterian Church family. Dr. Knox encouraged all of us in the Lord and opened the doors of Pullman Presbyterian Church annually to host this sacred homily, the seven last words of Christ. He gave McCormick students the opportunity to gain valuable experience in the delivery of the preached word. We honor his legacy today and thank God for his witness that has shaped students long before and will continue to impact generations to come. To God be the glory. And now, the seventh word. I will be reading the King James Version of Luke 23, verse 46. Hear the word of the Lord. My sisters, my brothers, and all of my siblings beloved, there are times in this life when trouble gets in your way. And when such occurs, the text helps us to see that sometimes you have to cry. I said, sometimes you just have to cry out loud. Pray with me on this subject, trouble in my way. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, Almighty God, our Mother, Almighty God, our all in all, right now, Lord, speak that we may come alive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have you ever been in trouble? Gotten into a little pickle? Had to deal with some trials, tribulations, and adverse circumstances. Anybody out there been in trouble? I'm talking about trouble, you know, the kind that's usually shrouded in shame. I'm talking about trouble, the kind that's often met with punitive consequences. I'm still talking about trouble, the kind that's typically associated with pain, anguish, loss, and despair. Some people run into trouble and there are others who run from trouble, but no matter the circumstance, we know that at some point 
in some place at some time in this life, we will experience trouble. Anybody ever been in trouble? Merriam-Webster's online dictionary has many definitions for trouble. Trouble stands for the quality or state of being. Trouble, uh, public unrest or disturbance. Trouble, a condition of distress, annoyance, inconvenience, or a condition of health or physical distress, a mechanical malfunction. Trouble, the difficulty experienced while trying to complete a task. It doesn't matter which definition you use, trouble is typically associated and understood as unwelcome and a negative outcome. Nobody, I said nobody really, wants to get into trouble. Unless that is your John Lewis, Civil rights activist and politician now seated among the ancestors who coined the term good trouble. Representative John Lewis devoted his life to racial justice and equality. He worked for decades as an activist and organizer for justice and marched in lockstep with the likes of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was an orator and an orator for action, standing and saying that sometimes you just have to get into some good trouble, necessary trouble, the kind of trouble that breaks chains and sets the captives free. Lewis admonished us not to get lost in a sea of despair, but he encouraged us to be hopeful and optimistic because our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or even a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. And we should never, ever be afraid to make some noise, to cry out loud and get into good trouble, necessary trouble. You see, I believe that even Reverend Dr. Eddie Knox Jr. also knew something about this kind of trouble. As the pastor of Pullman Presbyterian Church, 32 years in ministry and a vanguard of the faith, in 2015, Dr. Knox, at the cusp of election day, led a group of citizens to get into good trouble as they uh, marched downtown in the city of Chicago to City Hall and demanded Mayor Rahm Emanuel listen to the cry of the people. The people who were being terrorized by corrupt police officers and a broken system of law enforcement. A struggle and a trouble that yet plagues black and brown communities today. You have to cry sometimes and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Oh yeah, I'm in the text. You see in Luke 23 verse 46, we find Jesus in trouble, good trouble according to God's will and necessary trouble for us to have life in that more abundantly. You see, it was now about noon, y'all, uh, 12 o'clock in the middle of the day and darkness covered the earth. It was about noon, y'all. I said in the middle of the day, lunchtime, and the sun refused to shine. It was about noon, y'all, and gross darkness covered everywhere. I think James Weldon Johnson would quip it was blacker than a hundred midnights and down in a cypress swamp, it was about noon. And all into the afternoon, trouble was in town. And then at the ninth hour, about three o'clock, when the sun's light yet refused to shine, the veil of the temple was torn into two. And it was at this point we find Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in the middle of some major trouble. Jesus, Mary's baby, 
the one in whom God the Father is well pleased. Jesus in this moment is now hanging from a tree. I'm talking about Jesus whose body is bloodied, uh, bludgeoned, and brutally beaten. Jesus whose body was whipped and stripped of its dignity. Jesus whose head was pierced with a crown of thorns and whose side was pierced it's just the same. Jesus, our lily of the valley, our Jesus, our Lord, was in trouble, in the middle of some serious trouble, agonizing trouble, languishing trouble. We find Jesus in this passage being crucified, in real trouble, paying a debt that he did not owe because we own a debt that we could not pay. Jesus was in trouble, y'all, and this time he had to cry out loud. Verse 46 says, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, the first point, trouble in your way, cry out loud to the Father. Family, you have to cry sometimes. When the burdens of life overtake you, when there's more month than money, when your back is against the wall, sometimes you have to cry with a loud voice, cry out loud to the Father. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The second point, trouble in your way, put it all in his hands. Right here in the text, Jesus not only put his trouble in God's hands, but he even commends his spirit there also. In other words, Jesus entrusted God to protect and preserve all that he had in the middle of his trouble. What about you today? Is trouble in your way? Then put it all in his hands, whatever the trouble, whatever the problem, this and that, put it all in his hands. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. The third point, trouble in your way, give it up. If you put it all in his hands, then Leave it there. Jesus gave up the ghost. He breathed his last breath. He allowed his spirit to return into the loving and capable hands of our father and did not look back. Similarly, we ought to cast our trouble upon the altar of the Lord and do not look back. I have decided to follow Jesus and his example, no turning back, no turning back. Family, is there trouble in your way? Problems got you down? Be encouraged, for I know a man who carried our troubles and is familiar with our grief. And he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon his shoulders, and by his stripes, we are healed. That's what Jesus did. Got trouble? Get Jesus. Because Jesus knows all about our trouble, and he will guide till the day is done. Is trouble in your way? Cry out. Cry out loud to the Father. Put it all all of your troubles in his hands and give it up. Leave your troubles in God's hands. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Let us pray. Father, I stretch my hand to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, O oh, whether shall I go? Lord, we may have to cry 
sometimes. Teach us to trust you with our troubles and leave them in your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.